Okay. Let's move on to the City Council. I'd like to call the meeting of the Urbana City Council to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Barnes? Here. Mr. Bowersox? Here. Ms. Shuttleworth? Present. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Roberts? Here. Mr. Smythe? Here. Ms. Stevenson? Present. Mayor Pressing? Here. First item is approval of minutes of the previous meeting. We have two, March 3rd and March 24th, the special meeting. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Smythe, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Are there any additions to the agenda? Okay, we'll move on to petitions and communications. Anyone who would like to address the City Council, please come forward and, and give your name and address. And please don't take any more than uh, five minutes. I do have a card that's been filled out by Diane Marlin. Would you like to speak, Diane? Oh, you want to wait till late, to later in the agenda? What's the topic? Okay, sorry. Can't read English sometimes. <laughs> Okay, anyone who would like to speak now before the meeting starts? I mean before the rest of the agenda? Okay, um, I would like to announce that our controller Ron Eldridge has once again won the award from the Government Finance Officers Association for our annual financial report. He received a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting and the, the city has received this for quite a number of years. So. I think we should congratulate him. Is there any old business? I've got a card. Okay, um, Dennis Roberts. Okay, this is uh, just kind of an FYI. Um, last weekend, I guess it was last weekend, the weekends are, are accumulating themselves so fast. Uh, there was a con there was a musical performance at uh, Lincoln Square Village, uh, led by the uh, um, conserv the, con the Conservatory of Music for Central Illinois. This is a, a local-based music uh, uh, teaching uh, community group. Um, they did a, a concert of uh, music. Uh, there was an orchestra, um, and they had asked me to come down and uh, be present while they. Uh, played and sang happy birthday to the city of Urbana because it's our 175th birthday. So I did so and they presented the city with a birthday card. So I appreciate that very much and we're going to pass this on to the city clerk. Okay, um, thank you. Next is um, the Committee of the Whole. Who's reporting for that? Uh, that that's business? myself, yeah. From the Committee of the Whole, um, we have uh, two ordinances that have come that have been forwarded for um, discussion um, uh, to the uh, City Council. Uh, and these are uh, th these are ordinances that are in interrelated and they have to do with the sign the signage at uh, South uh, Philo Road. Uh, first is Ordinance Number 2008-03-017, an ordinance approving a major major variance to allow an electronic media message board and LED sign to increase the frequency of message changes from once per three minutes to once per 10 seconds at the southeast corner of Windsor Road and Philo Road in the B3 General Business Zoning District, 2710 South Philo Road. This is case uh, zoning board uh, 208 uh, major or MAG-01 and this is uh, coming to us from the special city council or city council meeting last time. And in, also, I might as well read the other one, which is Ordinance Number 2008-03-018, an ordinance approving a major variance to allow an electronic message board LED sign to be multicolored at the southeast corner of Windsor Road and Fowler Road in the B3 General Business Zoning District. 2710 South Follow Road, case number ZBA-208-MAJ-02. 
So for the um, committee, I uh, present these and move their approval. In omnibus fashion? Yes, in omnibus fashion. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Roberts, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Um, Libby Tyler, our community development director, is here to explain these items. Well, these were forwarded from a previous meeting, and um, there are revised ordinances attached that um, make clear the special circumstances that pertain to this variance case, so that changed language is underlined in the ordinances in your packet. And I, in reading these things, I would just like to comment that um, since they're going to be one, I think it's one-tenth of what is allowed, I think we're allowing too much. You know, if this is only one-tenth and it's a big enough oh. sign that the, what we are, the Goodness, rest of the 90 percent there is, mm -hmm. sounds like a lot of signs. So I've asked Libby um, to look into cleaning up our sign ordinance because I think some of these gigantic signs that we have in front of shopping centers are not really very attractive. And we get to a really big shopping center like Marketplace, they obviously don't use that type of sign. They have um, signs on the buildings. So um, is there any discussion of, of this motion? Um, Mr. Roberts. <coughs> Actually, maybe I should defer to anybody else, but OK. And uh, perhaps it would have been wise rather than to forward them as omnibus uh, to talk about individually the uh, elements that, that are involved in the sign ordinance. Um, the, I think that overall I, I favor having one unit sign rather than several individual signs marking the location of the shopping center. It's perhaps um, a new, uh, it's, a, it's a newer development which perhaps requires a different approach to signage. The fact that this, the buildings have been um, sequestered into the central area of the shopping district and they're not immediately visible or approachable from the street itself is actually uh, perhaps a commendable design attribute. So to appropriately allow for signage, normally we would allow quite a few signs at the various entrances to the subdivision or to the shopping center. I think the fact that the um, that the applicant is interested in limiting how many signs are being placed up along the highway actually improves the general greenscape of the city. So I'm in favor of that approach. The question that I have the greatest um, difficulty with is partly the fact that these display signs are becoming more prevalent now in um, our community. And it is a definite choice in a new direction for visual signage along the highway. I realize that it is a trend to place the LED components in signs and billboards. This is a modern trend it has to do with technology. Um, if, if the, I think that the city is willing to look at this new technology, but I think we should do it very cautiously. I think that it needs to be spelled out that this is a very particular situation which allow, if we're going to allow these signs. And I would like to just su suggest this. I think that a signage that changes every, t every 10 seconds, this is a very large, um, this is a very large change from a three minute duration period that had been on previous signages. Uh, we're going to much more rapid imagery um, shuttling. And I think perhaps this is maybe just a little too rapid without damaging the intent of the, um, the developer to display as many pieces of information as he can to the public. I think the city also needs to consider whether signs that change every 10 seconds cause a distraction. Certainly, we are, we are most of us the television generation. We are attuned to, to, to watching or looking at video display. And because we have this tendency and we're most almost specifically trained to be attentive to it by the very nature of our, bring, our upbringing, I have a concern about the 10 second interval. So I would like to make a motion that we allow the change and it be more rapid than three minutes, but I would like to suggest for discussion that it be 20 second durations that are allowed. 
This will still allow three different stores to display their image per minute, which certainly would meet the needs of the development. But I think that it would allow for a more moderate initial approach to this kind of signage, and I'd be very open to discussion about my motion, if it would be received. There right. would be Are you need making for a, that. a friendly amendment to your previous motion? Yes, I am. Uh, I moved. I moved that for the, the for the committee of the whole, and I'm making this mo this as a friendly amendment. Okay. Tonight. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second by Charlie Smythe. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lynn Barnes. Oh. There is no evidence that 20 seconds would be any different in terms of, uh, versus 10 seconds. I see that as fairly arbitrary, and and I think we should move ahead with the intent of what the of what the uh, owner. And the developer is interested in. You know, there's no evidence that 20 versus 10 is any different. I don't. Charlie? I'd, I'd actually like to hear from the developer's representatives as to how, what, how they would feel about 20 seconds as opposed to 10. Good evening, Council Members. Hi. Mm -hmm. Your name for the record? Jenny Park from Meyer Cable Law Firm. And Jane Solon from the Atkins Group. Okay, so what, would you like to comment on the suggestion? Um, Ten well, seconds. Oh. I was going to help you along. Could you remind me how many businesses you've got to display? Um, there could potentially be um, anywhere from um, 12 to maybe 18, maybe more than that. It just depends on how small the tenant spaces are, and it could be less than that, but it, you know, probably in that range. Um, as you saw from the demo that we showed two weeks ago, 10 seconds seems like a long time when you're sitting there watching it, waiting for it to, to change. Um, people are at that intersection only so long, so the tenants are not going to have someone looking at their name as long as if they had all these individual sites out front where someone transversing that intersection could see their name constantly. Retail tenants love for people to see their name their logos. That's how they're recognized. Retailers would not find it as advantageous to have their name shown fewer times than what they are. And the studies that have been done show that 10 seconds is not a detriment to traffic, nor does it cause accidents. Just, just so we note the math, so at 10, at 10 seconds, 12 signs, it'd be two minutes to three minutes for 18 businesses. Uh, at a 20 second interval, you're looking at four minutes to six minutes to cycle through eight, you know, 12 to 18. And beyond the tenants, remember we said we were going to put community announcements and other things up there as well, so it's, okay. you know. Um, Brandon, are, are you still, did you want to make a comment? Just had a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Were you next? Go ahead. My question is actually for Bill Gray. I don't know how long a traffic um, light is, and so I don't have a sense of what we're looking at in terms of the. I know that they're timed differently, but a traffic light at an intersection of this size, about how long would people be waiting at that traffic light? I, to give the exact amount of seconds, I'd have to research that. But generally speaking, um, say you're eastbound. Uh, at the stoplight and uh, at Fowler Road, you could be waiting, you know, 30, 40 seconds. <coughs> and to get the exact number, I could, but I just don't have that with me. But that's a, you know, reasonable number, 20, 30, 40 seconds. Was Brandon next or was Lynn next? Lynn, go ahead. I think this is a very well thought out proposal, very well thought out sign that they've given lots of, um, they've, they've listened to our city staff in terms of what we like to see, and I'd like to see this council support it strongly to show that 
we support when developers work with us closely and that we you know, can work very collaboratively and move things forward in an efficient way. So I'd like to see the council support it at 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Brandon? Yeah, I also am supportive of the 10 seconds as presented. I feel like given all the trade-offs in terms of the amount of total signage and everything that you know the developers doing to reduce the amount of signage that 10 seconds is is okay with me especially because now it's really clearly tailored that this is a one-time experiment this is a development that's very unique and a layout that's very unique and a variance that is very specific I also think 10 seconds isn't terribly out of line I was driving around in Champaign actually looking at the electronic billboards there they're billboards there are signs but um, at the Kirby location when I pulled off at Jerry's IGA and was counting, it was about seven seconds that they were changing. Um, and I know now I've seen maybe two or three of those electronic billboards in Champaign that rotate. So 10 seconds isn't at least out of line. Um, I haven't anecdotally here heard that the seven second billboards or anything have caused accidents and the research and IDOT standards seem to say that 10 seconds is at least some number that has some meaning. So. I'm comfortable trying it in this situation and supportive of 10. Robert Lewis. Yes, as, as I recalled last week, uh, last session, we uh, did discuss this timing thing, and I thought that uh, uh, in light of the stoplights and what we've seen in the past, the 10 seconds is more than adequate. If anything, you'd want to reduce that in order to get everybody in. But uh, <laughs> we got to step up to the plate as far as people in terms of observation because what what's done what has taken place here is a very uh, specific set of design criteria establishing what this building configuration is relative to the people passing by and i know in some states you can't even see the the complexes so this kind of sign would be more than adequate to provide the you know signage for the people within that complex or whatever. That's all I have to say. Heather? Well, I have been out to the Pines, and um, no one can fault the Pines for not doing superb work. You guys have done um, <laughs> incredible work out there, and um, I would like to see that we they've worked with us. They've gone above, I believe, the call of duty when it comes to design criteria. and. Uh, um, it looks great out there, and I, if we want business in Urbana to stay in Urbana and we want people to go to the businesses that are going to be there, let's get them as much as exposure as, as they can. And 10 seconds doesn't seem unusual considering they're not having three other signs that could be there. And um, like I said, I think it looks beautiful out there, and they've gone above and beyond the call of duty. Dennis Roberts. I don't think that anybody doubts that uh, the Atkins Group has done a superlative design job. We're not saying that. We're just saying that a city can be thoughtful about what it allows. And we have to make some kind of a determination about how our city looks, the kind of, um, uh, the kind of atmosphere that we're promoting along our city streets. We have some problems already with uh, large display signs in parkways. And we're trying to create a lower signage that's more um, visual friendly to people. There have been some some um, developers that really don't like that trend, and they want as large a sign as possible. Of course, a business is always going to want as much as possible. But I'm not here to support uh, every business that comes along. I do support business in general, but I also have to be responsible for the community as a whole and the direction the city goes in. I think that by, re by making the, the, the sign turnaround um, slightly less than was what's requested or what's perhaps allowable is not damaging to the, to the pines. The pines is going to survive whether there was 10 signs or one sign, a small sign or a large sign, because the quality of the businesses there will be known by the community and people will go to shop there. Signs or no signs, wherever the signs are placed. I believe. Um, I think that it's, that it, that we're going to be seeing more and more visual display signs brought before this council. It's very likely that people are going to be wanting to try to put up large billboards in the future and, and coming to us with these requests. 
So we have to be very cautious, and I'd rather start out very cautiously, get permissively, than just to roll over at any pr proposal that's brought before the city. I think that we have a more a greater responsibility. And by allowing three businesses to be advertised a minute rather than four or five, it's not going to damage the businesses of the Pines. You, you may have, uh, but I'm speaking for myself and as a neighbor, you're speaking as a, a um, you're coming to us from the point of view of the developer. So really what I'm trying to do is, is suggest a, uh, a compromise. But it doesn't seem to be great support here, so we'll find out what happens during the vote. Yeah. Um, could I just get, ask for a clarification? There will be signs on the buildings as well, right? Yes, but will they will be flat to the building? Okay. Uh, Danielle. Just a comment and a clarifying question. I support the initial mm -hmm. recommendation of 10 seconds. I appreciate that the developer has worked with the city to this um, extent. I think the sign is handsome, um, and I think we're being really careful about making sure that we're not setting precedent to open this up wider. Um, as a business owner who doesn't have adequate signage in front of my business, um, due to my own fault. I know the consequences of not having adequate signage. Signage is really important to businesses, and it's really important to retail businesses. So um, having two businesses displayed at the time that a traffic stop happens, or three businesses, is just not going to be adequate, I think, for, for retailers. I think common sense can tell us that. Um, the motion on the table, is it the original motion, or is it an amendment? Because we need to know when we vote. Um, we'll try to make that be clear. Um, there's an amendment there's on, the an amendment table on the table that was not the made by um, Dennis Roberts and uh, seconded by Charlie Smythe, and that was to change the interval to 20 seconds. Okay. So Is there any other discussion? Okay, let's vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment to 20 seconds, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. no. Okay, that motion fails. Okay, let's vote on the original motion. Just real which quickly, is I have a question for the, the, okay, you have the Atkins question? group while they're here. Real okay, quickly. go ahead. Um, uh, um, okay, so, so just so people know, this is what the sign looks like. I don't know if the cameras can zoom in on this. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's, it's 16 feet tall, and uh, I'm curious uh, how you decided that uh, uh, it would, was better to put the display above the pines sign as opposed to flipped around. You know, it's, it's, I, I, it's more an aesthetic question. Um, we felt that it would be easier for people in vehicles to see, see it at a distance when it's up higher okay. than because the sight of, of certain vehicles would cut off the Okay. Okay, and, and so along those lines, okay, right now it's at 16 feet high. I'm all in favor as short of signs as we can. You've got a lot of extra. You've got about three feet of space in here. Is there any reason it couldn't be, you know, I mean, I'm not going to quibble with this tonight or anything, but, but should, you, should you be able to, I would, you know, encourage you to make this as short as you can, you know, if you could remove the three feet or so from down here or two feet, and still have the same effect, I would encourage that, just to get as short a sign as we can, can out there, uh, especially along the lines of this is what you're trying to, to get out there. And the, the Pines is fairly large here, and I, I think it looks great. Uh, so, you know, I'm just encouraging that if it's possible. I do have a question, though. I, I wanted to compliment you on the lighting out there, which I find found very nice. And um, I, I wanted to know if, if somebody could send me the manufacturer of the, of the lights, and are they full cutoff? Are they also defined? I know they they look like full cutoff with a little, you know, sort of teardrop there to encourage water and dirt drop, you know, dripping off of them. But I, I was just curious as to whether they are considered full cutoff. I don't know whether they are, but I will send you the specs on Okay, that would be great. Thank you very much. So it's a great project. Uh, and, and as part of the whole, you know, it's sort of part of, you know, from that end to the other Philo Road improvements, I hope you like those. and. Uh, and, and, and approve of those that are coming later tonight. Brandon Bauer Sox. Yeah, just very briefly, thank you again. I just want to point out sort of why I support this in the whole equation. 
it's really important, I think, for the public to know that the total amount of square footage of signage, if they just did this by right without a variance, could be up to 800 square feet, and that the plan now is for 78 square feet. So part of the equation for me is that the developers have really tried to reduce the signage, but make it effective and make it handsome. So, um, so on balance, I support it. It's it's a particular experiment, and the rest of the Pines layout is great looking. It looks like things are a success, getting businesses there. So, best wishes. Anyone else? Okay. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Balasa. Yes. Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for not having nine more signs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, reports of special committees. I don't believe we have that. Um, reports of officers? Tom Carino, our economic development specialist. Good evening. Uh, you do have before you this month's economic development report. Uh, just to highlight some items on the report, um, the city has a number of uh, studies going on, uh, corridor studies specifically. Uh, tonight um, there was a uh, open house related to Philo Road. Uh, and there will be a presentation to council this evening. Next week, we have an open house related to the Boneyard Creek study, and you have a notification before you um, that is uh, going out to all of the neighborhood associations and um, business owners and property owners along the Boneyard stretch. Uh, that's at 4 o'clock uh, to 6 o'clock here at council chambers. And then there will be a presentation to city council later that evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're also working with a consultant on the Cunningham Avenue corridor, and we're also working on the University Avenue corridor. So a number of beautification projects going on along important corridors. Um, we also uh, found out today that the city is, uh, will be receiving uh, grant funding for marketing related to the market at the square from the uh, Illinois Department of Agriculture. That was an application that we made uh, late last calendar year, and we found out today that we were receiving funding for that. Uh, related to that, uh, it's hard to believe, but the market at the square is uh, only a month away. At this point, our first weekend will be May 10th. Saturday, May 10th will be the first weekend for the market at the square. And then finally, uh, this weekend, um, the city and the uh, U.S. Census Bureau started the special census in uh, the city of Urbana. The um, purpose of the special census is to ensure that the city is getting its fair share of funding uh, from the state for um, revenue sharing formulas based on population. Um, census employees are identifiable by their red, white, and blue Census Bureau badges. They'll be out in the community, and um, we ask that everyone cooperate so that the city can, uh, again, receive its fair share of funding from the state. Um, if anyone has any questions about anything p specific, I'd be happy to answer that. And we'll also ensure that everyone receives an electronic copy of the report. Brandon. One quick one about the Boneyard Creek Urban Design Study open house that's next Monday from 4 to 6 is um, you mentioned sending it to nearby businesses, but I actually think it's one of the most important plans for the whole downtown during this whole four years of council that we've seen. <laughs> so. Um, you might already be distributing it through the UBA or to all downtown business owners, but if you aren't, I just encourage distributing information as widely as possible because it really does affect the tenor of the whole downtown, and it's a beautiful plan. Sure. The, uh, it will be distributed uh, to the Urbana Business Association. Uh, all of the um, residential neighborhood associations will receive it. Uh, all of uh, Anyone who has participated in a Boneyard event uh, to this point will receive it. Uh, and then we've also set up a 250-foot perimeter around the boneyard to make sure that all those property owners receive it. Uh, we have uh, probably in the neighborhood of 120 to 150 people on our distribution list, so quite a few people. And then it will also be posted on uh, UPTV uh, as well as press releases to all the media outlets, so it will be pretty extensively advertised. Sorry, the open house will be here in city council chambers. 
from 4 to 6 on Monday, April 14th, followed by a presentation to City Council uh, at approximately 7 o'clock that evening. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thanks. All right, uh, next is new business. First is ordinance number 2008-04-024. This is an ordinance amending the City of Urbana Comprehensive Plan 2005. It's a bicycle master plan amendment. And I, I think we have a staff person here, do we not? To present Jeff this? There. Bill's here. Okay. Okay. I, I was um, gonna Charlie? Move, I'm going to move approval. You're going to move second. approval? Second. Why am I surprised? <laughs> okay. And who, you were second? I second. Okay. Motion by Smythe second. and seconded by Lewis. Is there anyone who wants to say anything about this? <laughs> you want to say something? Okay. Or do you, there, there's a presentation, correct? Oh, you don't. You've already done your presentation. A two-hour presentation? <laughs> Uh, any any comment from you, Bill Gray? You look like you're ready to say something. Uh, um, I think personally, it's a it's a great master plan, bike master plan. Um, kudos, credit, thanks to Rita and Gabe, their staff at RPC. I'll stop. Let Bill go now. And Jennifer, I mean these three and others, but in particular, all the meetings, um, various commissions. Etc. There's been a lot of effort and time put into this, and um, uh, I think it's a, a master plan to be very proud of. And I think it's an implementable plan. Um, yes, there's some costs identified, but I, I think we've been very successful in the past with grants. We're very aggressive about finding grant monies to do projects, and uh, we'll continue to do do so. And there's a pretty good roadmap as to what we'll do the next five, 10, 15 years. It may be tweaked from year to year, and that happens as grants and other things happen. But um, we're anxious to get going. And um, one <clears throat> big grant that we're applying for is the Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program monies for Main Street. Now, Main Street was one of the top three or so locations for bike lanes. And um, we've, believe it or not, identified probably over two million dollars worth of work. Now you think, well, how do you get that out of just adding a couple of painted lines in the street? Well, it's a bit more involved with that, but it's about a two mile uh, length of corridor of Main Street. There would be major street milling resurfacing, patching work. There would be a lot of ramps, ADA compatible um, uh, ramps at intersections, things of that sort. There'll be some bump outs in some locations, signage. And also we need to address traffic signals, which we haven't done downtown. So we need to upgrade. This would be the perfect opportunity to upgrade the main and Broadway, main and Ray Street signals, get the countdowns, the audible push buttons, and that sort of thing. And um, quite frankly, it would probably improve the fairly high traffic accident history we have at Race and Main for those who work or live downtown. Unfortunately, we have a, a higher uh, rate, accident rate than I'd like to see, and this could help that situation, actually. But anyway, that would be 80% funding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so federal dollars, now there's a variety of hoops to jump through when you get 80% uh, federal funding. But it would be a good project. And um, we have TIF money that could help pay for the local share. So that's just one example of maybe others that you see in the plan. So anyway, kudos, especially to these three individuals. I think they just did a great job. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you can. No, I, I, I think. Bill, Bill hit the nail on the head. It's, abs it's a great plan. I like the inclusiveness and the process that went into this, starting with the, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, taking it to the public, you know, getting RPC and, and a sub-consultant from, from, from LIB. I know Ed Barsati has been very valuable to staff. Uh, it, it's great that this is being done out of public works, which I think is uh, probably a more appropriate place for it than a lot of times it's done out of community development or something like that, that kind of group. Uh, so it's being done at a public works. I really appreciate Jennifer taking taking this on. And um, I, I've got a small addition I w I'd like to make to, to the plan, but um, which I've bounced off of RPC uh, earlier this evening. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to moving forward and, and trying to get that bicycle friendly certification that we're really after. And that's ultimately the goal. You know, Fort Collins took 12 years. 
uh, with a plan like this, hopefully we can do it a lot faster. And we're, we're aiming for five, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very ambitious, uh, but given uh, the track record of Public Works, which has already gotten one of these uh, federal uh, grants for uh, Goodwin, uh, I'm very hopeful. So uh, with that said, I'd like to amend, uh, move an amendment, and I, I passed out a, a, an item here. It basically adds in Section 8 or Chapter 8, I'm not sure which there is, there's a, a very, very a short introductory paragraph. This would be a second paragraph in that introduction. I had put 8.1, but it's really 8.0 or just 8. So after that very first introductory paragraph, I want to insert a second paragraph along with the definition up in the definition section that, that talks about complete streets. And uh, while this plan is not a transportation plan, it does have components of a transportation plan. And uh, complete streets is a concept that's being talked about in a number of uh, cities and counties uh, around the country. It's recognized in, by the federal government. It's included in state law now. And so I thought it'd be important to have some kind of a statement uh, in, the, uh, um, in the plan itself. So, uh, <coughs> sorry, I've got this terrible cough. Uh, so I'd like to move the definition of complete streets as stated here, and then uh, an, an additional paragraph in, in Section 8 or Chapter 8 that says, while this plan is not an overall transportation plan for the city, routine bicycle accommodation is as part of any road work is recommended as one component, and so on, all the way down to where, I, where at the end it says, it is recommended that the city transportation plan or other council action adopt uh, the entire complete streets policy. So I move that as an amendment to the plan before us. Okay, motion by Mr. Smythe, seconded by Mr. Bowersox. Would you accept a friendly suggestion? Yes. Pedestrians shouldn't be capitalized? Um, yeah, I, the, whatever the, whatever the. That's in the, that's in the definition. Oh, yeah, okay. It should not be capitalized, right? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Anyone else have a, a comment? Um, Robert Lewis. Uh, it's primarily to build possibly a when you start looking at the review schedule for the comprehensive plan as this is incorporated into it, um, do we have a specific schedule that we are adhering to in terms of the timing of the review of the comprehensive plan? This will be adopted as an element, a standalone element, mm -hmm. and we talked about doing an update annually as a yes. goal, and then a five-year right. um, amendment. So we did do an update about a year ago, and um, we should be looking at a more comprehensive amendment in 2010. Okay. The reason I ask because when when Charlie mentioned the complete street concept, within the context of the comprehensive <coughs> plan, we talked about extensions of streets and roadways and in a sense that's looking at the complexity of doing that in a sense I was hoping maybe it would kind of come along with that yeah. but if it's going to be separate how do you address that continuity I think what we'll do is um, this is a massive document we'll continue to have this as a separate element of the comprehensive plan and it's important that it be adopted as an element because it's um, gives it a certain status in terms of our regulations. Okay. Um, but next time we go into our update of the comprehensive plan, we'll want to add some language about complete streets. So we'll make sure to do that. We may also um, wish to do that in our development regulations as well. Any other comments? If not, would the clerk please call? Amendment. Oh, we're okay. We are voting on the amendment, and is this the amendment to the to the comprehensive plan? To the bicycle master plan. Oh, mm -hmm. to the bicycle master plan, and is that numbering okay with the people who put it together? Is that correct? Okay. All right. Let's vote on the amendment. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Chinoweth. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I think, Bill, you'll be the person who can answer this, which is, um, um, or oh, Jennifer, the, the one section 
as I was trying to look through all the maps, and I keep trying to look through the maps, and um, it, it's it's fabulous. The question is, Broadway Avenue from um, in, or from Elton Street to Crystal Lake Park. What's the plan for that for that strip? Um, I know there's a lot of things that are changing, but I didn't see anything in particular for Broadway Avenue. And I'm sorry if I've asked this question before. I feel like I have, and I just couldn't remember what the answer was. Elm Street to Park um, yeah. would be bike lanes, and then um, Park down to Country Club Road is a side path. Is the side path. So mm -hmm. we are looking at bike lanes on both sides of Broadway from Elm to Park. Correct. Great. Okay, and just a, a couple of comments. I think that this is a dream come true. That's that's how it feels to me. It's a dream come true. Um, I think is seven years ago when I first got on council, because of litigation that we saw on the state level and concerns that we had about legal precedent, at the time it looked like we would not be able to have bike paths in Urbana. And the thought that as a city, where 30 percent, well, about a third of the people walk, bike, or take public transportation to work or school, which is phenomenal in this country. It's unbelievable how many people use alternative modes of transportation um, other than cars in the city of Urbana. It was, it was kind of a tragic situation we were in seven years ago. Well, I think. Actually, Chicago has shown a lot of leadership on this, and as a result of things that Chicago has done and other communities, I think that legal opinion has changed to the, to the point where we feel confident that we can do the right thing for um, bicyclists and pedestrians in our community by putting in these um, these bike lanes, because sometimes if the bikes aren't the streets, they're on the sidewalk. So it actually helps pedestrians quite a bit to have these bike lanes. Um, I think that this we, the mayor has signed on to cool to the cool cities initiative as a mayor and the, and one of our goals is to have is to develop sustainable design and so an important component of this is this is one of maybe the top 3 or 4 things we could do to decrease our greenhouse emissions and to decrease the co2 that we're putting into the environment because we can't expect people to use bicycles to get to work or school if they're taking their lives into their hands every time they do that for example, last night I was trying to figure out how to get from Behringer Commons, where it was at a gathering, back to my house near downtown. And it was after dark, so it's dark outside, there's cars on Main Street, there's not a sidewalk for a portion of Main Street, and Main Street is a very dangerous place to be in with that darkness, etc. So there's this sense that I, I literally at times got off my bicycle, pulled it onto the side onto the grass, let the car go by and put the bicycle back onto the track. So this is the kind of thing that we're facing in, in a couple of areas that are really tricky and Main Street of course is one of the targets of this. Um, Public safety is one of our top goals, and this is a major component to supporting public safety. And um, and I think that more bikes, in term, if we think about just dollar per dollar, if we can get people bicycling and walking and taking public transportation, the impact on the surface of the roads, which is by far so much more expensive than what we will pay in terms of paint and some amenities for bicycles, the impact of the road on the road of car, of um, trucks and cars is so much greater than it is of bicycles that in terms just in terms of um, our fiscal responsibility as a city encouraging bike use and getting p more people biking is not only good for their health but it's also good for the bottom line of the city so for all of those reasons i support this and i like i said i think this is a dream come true okay anyone else would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Barnes? Yes. Mr. Bowersox? Yes. Ms. Shenowitz? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Very much. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. For all your work. <laughs> the next item is the Philo Road Beautification. It's a motion to accept the design development plan as presented. And um, perhaps we should start with Diane Marlin. Would you like to speak first? We have a citizen who would like to make a comment here. You 
get two for the price of one. <laughs> My name is Diane Marlin. I'm a co-coordinator of the Southeast Urbana Neighborhood Association. Um, Teresa Michelson, co-coordinator of SUNA, and um, I live at 2013 Silver Court West in Urbana. I'm at 2203 Boudreaux Circle. Um, as you know, about three years ago, SUNA was formed to address the following concerns about Southeast Urbana. One was the um, redevelopment of Orchard Downs. Another was the perception of crime in Southeast Urbana. We had concerns about rental property mismanagement and maintenance problems and the negative impact on the neighborhood. And our fourth major concern was the revitalization of the Philo Road business corridor. Um, we've made tremendous progress since then, thanks to the Mayor's um, Neighborhood Safety Task Force and the Snow Removal Task Force. Um, and her working with Chief Bealey, we've made uh, tremendous strides, I think, in changing the um, neighborhood for the better. There's been very enthusiastic code enforcement on, in the Community Development Division and the City Attorney. Um, new apartment owners and managers have come in and uh, improved the appearance of the apartments and have made a lot of progress in um, improving management, especially along some along Colorado Avenue and uh, Florida Avenue, and um, certainly the businesses like Myers, the Pines, Chris Creek, the County Market Renovation, um, Walgreens, and even the uh, upcoming changes to the facade of Sunnycrest have made a huge difference. So this design development plan that you have under consideration tonight is just another very important piece in the overall um, revitalization of this area. We think the plan uh, welcomes visitors. It looks like it's going to be very bike and pedestrian friendly. We uh, appreciate very much the work of Public Works, Bill Gray, and uh, Schreiber Anderson Associates. And we believe that this is now the time for the city to invest in this corridor. We're on the, we're on the cusp of, of really, really great things and making a permanent turnaround in this area. And it really will set the tone. The first few blocks of this uh, beautification will set the tone for the entire corridor from Florida down to Windsor. And what you do in this piece really will determine what happens, I think, um, further south. So this kind of plan and beautification um, proposal encourages people to come out and do good things in the area. And I think that discourages other people from coming out and doing bad things in the area. So once your special census reveals um, all the new residents that we know are living out in South Urbana, you're going to want to get them to Philo Road and shop and walk and just enjoy each other and, and build community. So this is a great opportunity to do so, and we encourage you to invest what you need to do to do this right, because this will be with us for a long time. Thank you very much for your vision. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Garrett Perry from Schreiber Anderson. Good evening. Um, the last time I left you, we had uh, just completed the master plan for Philo Road. And what I'll be doing tonight is going through the uh, design development plans that we have currently um, completed or are close to completing. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what, what our scope of work is for this portion of the project, um, as mentioned, we're developing design development plans for uh, Philo Road. Um, this is going to transition us into hopefully construction documents. But as we left you in the master plan, there was some kind of holes and gaps, and you couldn't really see the entire picture of what was going on. So the design development plans took that image or that, that concept that was developed through the Shrep process and through the community process, um, which we developed the master plan, and then laid that out in real sense from Florida to Colorado. Um, hopefully, as we continue on, we'll take these development or design development plans and, again, take them into construction documents. Um, also, in our contract, we're going to assist the city in um, going through the bidding process, going out and, and um, uh, soliciting contractors to bid on the project. And then finally, uh, when bids come in, we'll help the city to evaluate uh, the final contractor um, and help to hopefully um, award the project. Um, the design development process, um, where we are currently um, 
we or, there was a um, steering committee that was developed. Um, it was a num about a member of 12 um, from various different uh, uh, factions of the city. Um, we had an initial startup meeting that basically reviewed the master plan, um, kind of critiqued it, put it in a more um, uh, realistic sense. Where are things going? How does it relate to the existing businesses? Um, so on and so forth. Uh, we took that initial concept and laid it out uh, and gave it, or we, we received feedback, put it down on, on paper, gave it back to them for an, uh, even more review with costs involved, so now that there's a realistic cost that's involved with it. A lot of things that were discussed about, you know, outside of right away, inside of right away, what was to be included, what was not to be included. We then took that plan and did a, another curse review before we brought it to you just to, just to make sure that we had all our... Um, I's dotted and T's crossed. And then uh, what we've presented to you tonight are the final design plans. Um, we did hold a, or we, we did a walkthrough um, this evening with the, uh, a number of the steering committee members just to kind of confirm of what we're doing or what we had shown is still applicable. And then we also had an open house uh, where we had approximately 12 or 15 members of the community that came through. Um, I think the only comment that we heard that was on a negative context was somebody had some concern about not separating the bike lane from the vehicular lane. But that, that was the only real thing that we heard as a negative. Everything else, everybody's very excited, um, very uh, anticipatory of what is to be happening in the, in the corridor. With that being said, uh, I'd like to take you through the plan. Um, we're working from uh, north to south, working from Philo, or excuse me, Florida, down to Colorado. Um, as I'd left you before, the, the original concept is this undulating band of, of natural landscape that kind of um, translates through the, through the landscape. To really kind of change the character of the area, um, adopt, or still maintaining the, the complete streets, but incorporating the amenities in that right-of-way as best as possible um, so that it, it it has a more flowing and kind of quote unquote natural feel to it. Um, you can see a lot of the land, there's some landscape that's actually out of the corridor. As I talked or as we talked before, there is still going to be some coordination that will have to happen with business owners. Hopefully that they'll see um, the excitement in the corridor and they'll want to participate. I know that uh, um, Libby and Tom and, and Bill have been speaking with developers and there's some, um, actually Chris Creek was an, another person that was very interested in um, seeing our landscape plan or seeing the landscape plan and want to adopt that into theirs. They think that that's a, it's a great idea and it will help them to kind of um, um, better make that, that, that welcoming to their businesses. Um, as we had mentioned before, sidewalks remain as is. We just walked today, and we thought there—I thought there'd be a lot of sidewalk that would come out, and actually, there's about two squares that are in poor condition. Everything else is in great condition, surprisingly. I don't know if it's people are just riding on the road and not walking on the sidewalk or what it is, but the, the sidewalks are great. Um, but it also gave us an opportunity to look at what's happening in the corridor. Where do we start doing rain gardens? Where do we start doing bioswales? And I'll take you through some of these areas. For example, um, directly out from the, the Chinese restaurant on the, south, or on the west side of the street, um, you'll see that there's an area between the sidewalk and, and the parking lot. All of the, the rainwater from the parking lot drains into the terrace or into the greenway. Um, there's enough area there to where we can depress that a bit and create a bioswale, uh, or excuse me, a rain garden, um, an area where the water could actually filter back into the, um, into the underground. Um, as you continue to the south, um, actually, I want to make a one quick, correc quick correction on this on plan two. Uh, the the the, um, the driveway that's being shown for Walgreens is actually going to be aligning with Chris Creek's uh, development, so that that will have to be amended. Um, the MTD stops are going to be located approximately where they're being shown right now with a mid-block crossing in between the two. Um, that creates that nice, uh, the ability for people to cross. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic as you go out there. You'll see people crossing back and forth mid-block and not going at the intersection. So rather than fight it, give them a mid-block crossing to where they can actually cross safely. And the MTD stop is a, is a perfect location for that. 
Um, looking at the, the Chris Creek development, there's, there is a, um, we're, we're hope, hopefully having him to encourage, uh, or the city is a lot, encouraging a um, connection from the, 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 the apartment buildings to the rear or to the, to the east and having there a connection through uh, the Chris Creek development into the Philo Road. Rather than having them cross through or have to go up a block to get to this, this corridor, this creates a, a good location. Uh, also, it's a very close location to the bus stops as well. So, and it is a nice termination to hopefully what, what will be eventually a, a pocket park. Um, the area from the, on the west side, west side from the um, bus stop down to the first driveway, um, there's some lower uh, sidewalk areas. What we're going to try to do is make a slight depression between the sidewalk and curb and allow that to be a bioswale so the water will actually enter into the terrace and filter its way through and approximately two-thirds of the way down towards the, um, the, cur or the uh, uh, curb cut, there is a uh, drainage, drainage inlet. So that allows that, that water to go through, get filtered, and eventually drop into a drain inlet with some filtration as it goes through. Um, sculptures, if you want to go back to uh, sheet one, uh, sculpture, we're, we're locating three sculptures in this zone. Uh, one being at the, um, we looked at trying to locate someone on the west side. It's a very tight area and most of those areas are, they're right up against the parking lot. So we felt it was more conducive or thought that it was more conducive to put the, the um, sculptures on the east side of the street, one of which being at the entry in, in, on Florida, continuing down at the pocket park um, on the, on the uh, east side. And then again, um, down at Colorado, there's a great location for that right in front of the CVS. We investigated that today and it looks like there's a, a possible location. One community member did mention maybe there's a possibility instead of having the sculpture behind uh, the parking or the, 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 the bench, there might be some way of incorporating a bench and a small plaza kind of area so that there's a way to enjoy that sculpture. So that's something that we can investigate as we go through. Um, a lot of the vegetation, if you look at, um, as you go through the plans, the smaller, the smaller circles, the sm uh, smaller purple circles are ornamental trees. Those would all be new. Um, the uh, darker colored green uh, shader trees, the larger color circles that have a darker color to them, those would all be new plantings. Everything else is pretty much there. We investigated a lot of the plantings that are in there and um, we evaluated, Mike Brunk was with us and, and uh, pretty much most of the vegetation that's there is going, would, would stay and we would just complement it with, with additional shade trees. Um, one of the main things that we tried to do with this landscape is in the event that the, there is not a lot of uh, coordination or a lot of, of uh, participation with the existing landowners that if that land doesn't get landscaped, the plan still holds on its own. It's not, it won't look like it's missing a tooth. It, it's, still, it's still viable, it still works well. So even taking those pieces out, you're still going to have a landscape that's very um, dominant, very uh, celebratory, very um, uh, natural in, in essence. Um, so uh, um, we, we designed that intentionally so that you know, we, don't, we don't get hung up with having to deal with um, or always have to, to work with the store or the property owners in order to make the landscape look correct. Um, some of the amenities, um, currently we're not, we're leaving the lights as they are. They're not going, the, the lights on the west side are, are remaining in place. We are, however, going to retrofit them with some type of an, uh, with a, an arm to, uh, to push the light farther out on the road. And then I'll show you the fixture in a little bit here, but we'll be adding a fixture to that arm. That fixture is going to match. We've also, uh, to offset, you'll, so you'll get these pools of light as you go down the street from the, from the main roadway lights. We just want to ensure that we're going to get full lighting so there's this band of light that goes all the way through the right-of-way so it's a very comfortable, uniform lighting pattern. And to do that, we, in, we, in, um, we incorporated pedestrian lights on the east side of the street and they alternate so they're in between the roadway lights. And that fixture matches the roadway light that's on the, on the west side. Um, 16 foot height, I'll show you a, a cross-section here in a, in a second. Um, 
Benches and trash receptacles are the main amenities that are going to be located in the corridor. It was decided by steering committee that until not until later or until they find out that there's more activity needing, currently we're going to we're going to suggest to put the bike parking up towards the the retail area so that that's a, a better location for them. If in the event that there's a lot of people, you know, parking their bikes or locking their bikes on signs or whatever in the corridor, then that at that point in time, that's when you want to start in, incorporating um, bike parking. Um, main benches and trash receptacles are located at, at main pedestrian intersections, so at the intersections of Florida and Colorado, and where the pedestrians actually come into the corridor, and specifically around the MTD stops. Um, trash receptacles, MTD stop, um, and then vegetation. I'll show you some images of what we're proposing as far as vegetation. And that's pretty much the design development uh, landscape plans. Um, you'll see the cross section following um, shows the overhead roadway light uh, with a complete full cutoff uh, light fixture uh, and a complementary pedestrian light on the opposite side, um, showing that the terrace is is, is uh, dominantly uh, planted with uh, native landscape. We do still have some boulders; they're very limited, not as many as we had we had originally shown in the first concept plan. Um, but there will be a smattering of those in the in the terrace, um, and then obviously the sculpture to show the the full cross section of of Philo Road. Uh, amenities. Um, the benches, uh, there was kind of a, 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 a thought of what the bench should like. We, I threw out a, a number of different ideas, and this, these two, the, the uh, bench and the trash receptacle, were kind of the, the dominant element that most of the steering committees kind of levitated, levitated towards. Um, it's a great bench. It, it, is, it is rather comfortable. Um, but uh, it also creates an art piece. It creates, it's not, it's not just a bench, but it creates this art piece in the landscape. That's a laser etched aluminum panel. Um, some of the color that was debated, uh, currently we're thinking about a, a dark bronze, so it kind of stays different from the downtown. Um, and then the trash receptacle and the uh, bench will match. The bike rack is a simple loop rack. Um, as we had shown in, in earlier plans. And then you can see that the pedestrian light or the, the, the light is a full cutoff. We tried to stay to a prairie theme as much as possible. Um, you know, and, and we think that we are fairly successful with what, what has been selected. Um, and then the landscape, again, is going to be more of a natural planting. Um, I have provided, I did, Bill, did you pass out a, a landscape schedule? Did I give a, did they get a plant palette? Or did not, okay. Oh, you did. So, um, my, okay, good. Yes, yes. Um, Mike Brunk and I are still working through that. Um, all of the plants that you see on that schedule are indigenous plants to this area or to Illinois. Um, I have not gone to the next step of research to find out availability. A lot of times native plants are a little bit difficult to, to find, but we'll try to stay as true as possible to the indigenous plants of, of, uh, of Illinois. And you can kind of see some of the imagery. That's what we're trying to. That's what we're trying to, to, to do. There was some debate whether we do grass seeding and actually seed that band. Um, the more we talked about it, it was more realistic and easier for maintenance to actually do hardscape plants. So you're actually going to see physical plants out there. Quick reaction. There's going to be a quick landscape out there rather than have to wait for five years before that that prairie grass come into fruition. So. Um, and then you have an example of a bioswale um, up in the top right. Costs, um, you have the cost in your packet. Um, according to Bill and Doug Miller, um, we're on track and we're still doing fine with, uh, with where we are with costs. Um, those will get further refined as we go into to more detail of the landscape. Um, future schedule. Uh, from here on, after uh, hopefully you approve these plans, we will continue on and, and uh, with the steering committee and uh, more probably more city staff, we will go through a process of construction documents where we'll have three uh, review meetings of the construction documents, a 30%, a 60%, and 100%, hopefully having construction documents done sometime around early July, <laughs> possibly uh, late June if we really press it. Um, we'll advertise four bids in July. 
construction sometime around mid uh, mid uh, mid August, uh, early September, and hopefully having it completely uh, landscaped and done and ready to be walked on in early November before Christmas. So, um, and that's those are design development plans. So I'll field any questions that anybody has. Um, I'd just like to ask a real quick question. On your typical section, Florida to Colorado, you, have, you show um, a shade tree in a parking island. Yeah. About how many years would it take to, for a tree to be that size? Because you, I mean, they're not, you're, okay, these are not existing trees, right? No. Well, there's there's some, some I can't say that all, there are some tree islands that have trees. Um, that was one of the bigger comments, or a, a very large comment from the from the shred process, is to mm -hmm. get trees out in right. the parking lot. It's kind of beyond our purview. Um, but just as a rhetorical question, if you know, if we were to plant a tree in there and it was had perfect care and was maintained really well, 15 to 20 years, depending on what size you. I mean, you could put in four inch, five inch, six inch caliber, caliber trees if the if that island is able to take it, and you're going to get a, a lot more bang okay. later or earlier than, than later. Okay, thanks. Charlie? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, one quick question. I appreciate the, the, the full cutoff lighting. Thank Good. you very much. Um, it, I'm trying to remember, is it the same lighting they use in the pines or not? Or it's a little, it's, It looks similar, but it's, it's not. It's similar, but they're, it, I mean, we have not locked this down to a specific Light, yeah, light, okay. like a vendor. Uh -huh. da, da, da. Okay. Um, there still will be a three, a three name um, specification, okay. so that we get better pricing. Yeah. The other, the other concern I have is uh, uh, lighting levels. Mm -hmm. I know that like Campus Town Green Street, they're they're over the recommended lighting yeah. level for a mixed residential business. Uh, they're they're they exceed level four. And I assume this is a level three or a level four lighting intensity. Or We're working with Tom Burtness. Okay. You're familiar with Tom? Yeah, well, okay. but he also did Campus Town. That's why right, I'm asking the question. Right. Uh, so I, I want to make sure this stays at level three or level four, whatever's appropriate. And, and um, what I can say is that we are going to maintain IES standards. That's where uh, where we, we, if we go below IES standards, we get into legal issues. Um, so. It would behoove you not to go below IES standards unless you want some litigation in later date. I, I assume that the lighting we have out there is already to standard, right? We don't know. We haven't done calculations. Okay. I would, I, it would, it would probably have to be close. I would imagine. But I, the the main goal, the main focus is to um, it, the, the street type will be identified, and then we will do what we can with what we have. Uh, to maintain IES standards as much as possible. I, I, I don't, I don't know whether this is considered a level three or a level four. You know, it, since it's commercial, um, and there is some residential in there, so I'm, I'm not sure where it where it falls in the mix. But, but you know, I, I hope that we're not going to exceed you know level four. No, 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 no. It, well, it's yeah, it's it's. Uh, Bill, if you could help me, have any idea what the, the classification of the street may be? No, I, <clears throat> I haven't looked at it yet, and that's going to be the next phase, if you will, and, and Mr. Burtness will work with us in those details. But, yeah, we're going to follow. It's our intention to follow the IES standards. Yeah. And the only standards, kind of so. go over those is, is if they're recommended to go over, if it's suggested to the consultant. But traditionally, the consultant stays with an IES standards. Um, by going over, somebody has to direct you to, to go over that standard. So. Okay, Heather? Um, I've sat in on a couple of meetings, and thank you, Garrett, for all the um, work you've done. I think that this is a plan that um, is beautiful in design and I think will attract people to the city of Urbana and specifically Phyla Road and to do business and be a community. And so with that being said, um, I would make a motion to accept the design development plan as presented. Okay, motion by Heather Stevenson, seconded by Charlie Smythe. Um, Dennis Roberts. So, who's going to? Sure. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, overall, I'm very supportive of um, beautifying, beautifying Filo Road, making it more um, 
safe and friendly environment. A um, couple of questions, I think mostly for Bill, which are um, the, the pricing documents add up to about 365,000, but the memo talks about 500 to 650,000. What makes up the difference? Um, engineering fees are not included in there, and um, it's just kind of rounding off, if you will, of about a half million dollar uh, number. And I, when you're done, I'd like to speak to that other number in just a second. So the other number, meaning the 650. Okay, so so basically, it's about what it's 365 plus. You added a, some, a contingency of like 135,000. Well, no, I mean we're spending you know 80 to 100 thousand dollars in engineering fees. In engineering so, fees, okay, yeah. and then a little contingency. Yes. Okay, that that makes sense. Um, what it looks like some a few things have been scaled back about this, and I think that the the things that are really important are kept intact, and I think that scaling back is appropriate given budgetary concerns. Um, what are the expected annual costs in terms of maintenance for this? <clears throat> that, that's a very good question, and I think there's a couple of routes to go um, with that. One is is that assuming we use in-house staff, we're going to have to hire, um, I'll call it a seasonal person or someone that's going to be needing to work pretty much full time um, through a good portion of the year, six to eight months. And, you know, we need to give that individual probably a truck or we have to work out those details as far as transportation is concerned. But um, I would say to answer that question, and we need to refine this number a little bit, but we're probably in the twenty to $30,000 range. And what varies is, um, and tonight we're not um, prepared to really address this, but <clears throat> if we do a lot of private property um, landscaping, you know, who's going to maintain that? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if it's city staff and, and that's the route we go since we're doing the balance of the landscape, and that may make a lot of sense, but that's, again, additional cost, additional time. And should this be, you know, coming out of the general fund versus should we establish a special service area, you know, to work with all the property owners that are benefiting from it and, and mm -hmm. have that special service area pay for landscaping and the related expenses to that and pay for trash pickup on a daily or weekly basis, pay for sidewalk snow removal. Who knows? It could be whatever we want it to, to be, but that's a perfect example of establishing a service area between Colorado and Florida, and I've not broached this topic at all. We obviously we need to meet with all the property owners to see, you know, what is the collective um, um, thought. Some may not want any landscaping on their private property, and at this point, well, okay. But already we've gotten a few feedback on people that are very interested in having landscaping per what Garrett presented tonight. So um, by range, I would say it's probably going to be a twenty to thirty thousand dollar number um, when you look at the person and all the related expenses to maintain this to a level we want it to be maintained. And what I mean by that is it'd be something like downtown, which is fairly you know, labor intensive. It's not quite as big an area as downtown, but as you know, we have people full time, you know, majority of the year anyway, downtown doing a variety of care. Mm -hmm. So if I could. Speak to the other matter then, okay. Um, okay. or finish your questions. More questions yeah. Go ahead. Just um, the, it's unclear to me where the pocket park is. I, I, w I didn't get a chance to drive this area, and there's not a context here. So I, I've been like trying to yeah. draw on what the different businesses are. Sure. What's the, what's I, where's the pocket park, and what's to the east and west, or okay. in the north and south? Well, it's immediately south of the. It's under construction, a new retail strip center that Chris Creek is building, CTC Properties is okay. building, and it's literally on you know there and Paul Tatman property, which is the old Jewel Osco. There's a fairly large green grass open area, mm -hmm. and it'd be a very small portion of that open area. Now that's technically an outlot, so that could become developed. I mean, it's a fairly large area, but we would be, you know, seeking permission there. Or, I mean, it's our prime location since it's a large open green space. Mm -hmm. And are they amenable to that, or is it we're still in conversation? We're still, we really need to discuss that. Yes. Okay, and. Um, mm -hmm. 
the this this kind of new or revised plan is fully funded, correct? The last one it looked like there was going to be some funded shortfall. We didn't know where, where it would come from. What you see this evening, this half million dollars would be budgeted. Um, <clears throat> the mayor and the comptroller and myself have had some preliminary discussions, and we probably would be looking at borrowing money for this and paying it back over a series of five or so years, ten years, with you know debt service coming from capital improvement okay. and replacement fund money. Okay. Um, and then uh, my last question is in terms of the um, process, you know, I'm very pleased to see that there's there's artwork um, involved. I think it's really appropriate given some of the initiatives that private development has taken um, with the Atkins group. Um, even having some stones makes sense with Stone Creek being down the street, although um, I think it's better to invest in the artwork and the original work than, than some things like um, boulders. My question is, it doesn't look like we will necessarily have a public arts commission uh, set up by the summer, um, and yet what some of the guiding principles of the public arts program is that there's a competitive process for people to um, to competitively, uh, artists to com competitively pitch um, ideas, and there's a really um, important public input and public participation process, which, of course, this process has been very public input intensive. And so I guess my question is, um, what process were you thinking of in terms of the selection of um, sculpture? Uh, quite honestly, we were going to hand that off to the uh, Public Arts Commission. Okay. What we're doing... What Garrett is doing is suggesting locations that's not fixed in stone. These, we don't expect these to be built or erected or completed by November 30th or whatever, okay. not at all. But we're setting aside in this budget $40,000 to do hopefully two or one or three or in future years other. But there's like probably two or three locations that we can see mm -hmm. sculpture or some kind of art, you know, being located. And um, so there's a budget set aside, but no, the timing of that would be separate. It's not on the timing for him to complete the design. It's, it would be okay. a pot of money funded for the Public Arts Commission and for us commissioning okay. someone to do okay. that. And, and, I just, and even to add to that, I mean, we're showing these traditional you know, nodes where a traditional type sculpture would be. We don't know. I mean, maybe it goes to something different. Maybe it's um, some kind of venue that can be done within the right of way and is smaller. Um, you know, that all hasn't been completely um, hashed out. Um, we do know, though, if this venue, this the way we're showing it currently, um, is the way that you guys are going to go. You're going to still have to coordinate with private owners to to to, to either get an easement or, at, but. Being a business, I'd want that sculpture out in front of my business. I mean, it's going to attract cars. It's going to see my sign behind it, so on and so forth. But um, there's still another level of that design that has to happen. And I think that's what I have suggested to pass on and Bill has suggested is that whether that's the correct venue, whether it's the mm -hmm. static art, whether it's a, a rotational art, that, that's still up for debate. Okay. Just a, just a couple of comments, and then we can go into the issue of money, which is um, – I think that now that there's been a lot of public participation and there's a list of people who have been involved, that'll be really important to share with the Public Arts com um, Commission. And I think that the public who have been involved should really be thinking about the kinds of things that they're interested in and starting to have conversations. You know, Suna should discuss what kinds of things so that there's, so that we can uh, make this um, a model for the public input process in terms of the the um, arts decisions that we make. The just, second, just just real go quick, ahead. We did do some footwork on that too during oh, the draft, so there were some ideas that actually came out, and I'd love to pass that information along to whoever. Takes Great. The ball yeah. So let's just make sure, in you know, on the side of staff, that that if that knowledge transfer happens because it's kind of going from public works to community development. Mm -hmm. um, then the second is, I really think that this, the city is looking at a major investment in Philo Road, and I feel like the, the public, the private entities should be participating in that investment. And for the city to be fully, you know, doing the entire thing and sp spending all the money and making and doing all of the work to, to maintain it is really doesn't make sense. We have to be approaching this from a, a partnership perspective. Um, 
and also looking in public works if there's ways to reallocate current staff members, et cetera, so that we really um, are careful with the annual costs. Just the last piece I'll say is I didn't get, I wanted to walk this, this route so I could see it and I didn't get a chance to do that. But I, I do hope that we avoid a problem with um, benches in the right of way that happen throughout cities, which is when you look from an aerial view at where you put benches, it looks beautiful. Oh, there's going to be a nice green space. Then when you actually think about it, it's a gas station, it's kind of trashy, and then there's a bench and it's not even oriented in such a way that people waiting for the MTD, like it's on the wrong side of the street or it's on the wrong corner. So we should be thinking about, you know, let's not scatter benches because it's an interesting concept to scatter benches, but really be thinking about where people might be stopping to wait for the bus or putting it next to ice cream shops or places that might have outdoor patios and things like that and not be, you know, just looking at where there's an adequate right way because Otherwise, we certainly have these empty benches all over the country in the United States, and it's just um, it's poor planning. So, and the benches are fairly expensive, so we should be being careful with that. That said, most of the benches are designated for the pocket park, and of course, MTD stop, etc. But um, we should just be cautious. So, it l looks like right now two benches in front of gas stations. So we. I don't want to think we, about we, the roles of that. We walked that today as we evaluated, and you are exactly correct. They, if you look at Plan Three um, on Colorado, we have a bench and trash receptacle located facing Colorado mm -hmm. to the south. Not a good. Thing. It should actually face Phyla Road. That, should, yeah. that was a delicate look, way of saying yes. You yeah. need to look at what, where the MTD exactly. stops and, and just right put the bench on. there. Because I didn't know there was a. <laughs> I didn't know that the buses stopped at every intersection. Mm -hmm. And so you really want to have that venue. And you look at when we walk that, the grass is all trampled, and you know it's from people just you know going back and forth. So it's a perfect opportunity to put a bench in a trash receptacle, but just reorient it and then create a space to where okay. there's any head access. So you're right on. Great. Thank you. Okay, Bill, did you want to say something about the financing? Oh, the f I just have com no, a comment. Okay. Lynn Barnes. Um, I think this is a significant step um, in our um, efforts toward improving that area, and I actually think that this is going to push us over that tipping point if we haven't already gotten there now, but I think this is just going to push us over the accumulation of all the things, the positive things that are happening in that corridor, and this will just simply add to it. As far as the um, labor, you know, in terms of keeping this up, it's one thought is that we may be able to kill two birds with one stone and potentially partner with your Banna High School mentoring program and uh, capitalize on some of the uh, um, opportunity to engage some of our youth um, in potentially even learning about landscaping. It might help us to uh, uh, mitigate some of the costs uh, because obviously, you know, we would hire them at maybe a lesser rate than we might others and but yet give them an opportunity to be um, uh, gainfully employed as well as being mentored by someone who is knowledgeable in the area of landscaping. Just a thought. Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Um, you know, one item that um, <clears throat> I don't have any slam dunk recommendation for it gets into the fiscal impacts and why the range of costs is 500 to 650 thousand dollars that extra 150 thousand um, dollars has to do with the discussion of sidewalks a for the, our community particularly this business district to be pedestrian friendly a sidewalk to be comfortable for two people walking abreast or passing each other really you need to have a five foot wide sidewalk and unfortunately um, the sidewalk in this area is four feet wide there's a few exceptions in front of the Hartman bank or the the one bank south of the animal um, on I think it's page plan two yeah. two or no, it's actually no still on one. plan one yes the third building from south of Florida on the east side is a bank and that sidewalk happens to be about five feet wide, but everywhere else it's four feet wide. And the issue is, is that, as Garrett had mentioned, the sidewalk is in really excellent condition. There's two squares, ten foot in length, eight foot in length, that needs it's damaged, needs to be removed and replaced. But the balance is in very good condition, as old as the sidewalk may be. So the point is, um, 
under normal circumstances, there would not be a reason from a maintenance standpoint to remove and replace the sidewalk. However, uh, as evidenced by our uh, visit today, uh, one example was a mother pushing a baby in a stroller with two younger children, and they were, you know, lined up in procession, if you will, uh, one by one, walking down the street. They couldn't literally walk side by side because of the four foot width. And um, that's a negative component. But to look at removing all that sidewalk and then removing the driveways, which is then you get into the driveway removal from the curb, back a curb to so many feet on private property, those expenses add up to well over $100,000 if we were to do both sides. Both sides of the street are four foot wide for the most part, except for that one exception. And I have a hard time knowing where I could spend $100,000 somewhere else in all the infrastructure demands. Do we remove what I would say is perfectly good sidewalk, albeit it's not the most pedestrian friendly sidewalk, but still functional? Do we spend money? And I solicited this question and comment among the 12, 15 people tonight uh, and kind of got some you know, pushback from them. And, and a few of the comments were, well, why not do it later? And okay, and that makes sense as that sidewalk gets older ages and maybe it's time to replace it. However, if you think of the type of improvement we're doing, which is largely landscaping, you want to do sidewalk work now. The landscaping is the last thing you'd want to do in a project, not the first thing. And I, I would say that I would be pushing a headache on to some future public works director to do it at a later time. We have nice, mature, native vegetation here. And then we decide, okay, now we're going to put this five-foot walk in, and boom, the bobcat gets in and starts heaving up and trampling over all the you know, landscaping to get this done. It, it, we'd almost have to start over again. So it's a very difficult decision. I don't have a real good um, recommendation. Uh, part of me says if we're the timing is right, we're doing a lot of work here. If we want to really do it right from a pedestrian friendliness, comfortability standpoint, um, we could do it now. But the other part of me says, you know, it's functioning just fine. The condition of the sidewalk is just fine. Uh, yes, pedestrians, if we, Charlie and I would walk abreast down the sidewalk, he'd be on the sidewalks clearly, and my right foot might be on partly grass, partly sidewalk. That's just because just of the width of the walk there. So it's just one of those things. So I don't have a recommendation, but I want you to know that if there is a um, – if there's a need or a desire to do it, then I would say we should bite the bullet and do it now. Do it prior to the restoration of landscaping. Otherwise, if we're going to do it later, in my opinion, it would be much later. And it could be like like 20 years later or something uh, when the walk is really falling apart. So that's the tough part about this assignment is really coming up with a good answer on what to do with the sidewalk because it is only four feet wide. And just to support Bill, we looked at, I mean, I looked at a number of different ways of, is there a way that we can add a foot? Is there, right. is there a way that, that and it just is very difficult to do. Um, your cost to actually build just a foot of concrete, the forming, it's just, it just doesn't, it's not worth it. You're going to get contractors, are gonna, you're going to get high prices. You could do pavers on both sides, but then people aren't really going to want to be on the pavers. Um, it's too riggedy, um, and it just seems like it's almost, that's not the walking surface, that's more the landscape edge. So I've evaluated, I've been hacking over trying to figure out some way of going about this, but I think, I mean, I can't see of just a, a simple way of amending this to get to the five feet. One idea was just maybe do one side of the street, you know, um, obviously that's half the cost, but you know, do the west side, make that five feet or something, and leave the east, since you have a portion of the east is five feet by the uh, bank. But So I don't know. Um. <laughs> okay. um, I think Robert Lewis might be next. I had a couple questions primarily about the selection of materials in terms of the bench and some of the attachments to the concrete and stuff like that. Uh, maybe Bill can answer this. Do you have standards for that already in terms of finish? I'm talking about longevity and making this stuff last longer. I'm talking about maybe electrolyte corrosion right down here at the concrete level, stuff like that. Have you set that in place? 
We, yeah, we do look carefully at the specifications. Uh, we are looking at something at last that doesn't have a lot of maintenance uh, aspects to it. I know this is aluminum uh, material, so it should be corrosion resistant. Uh, it will be shop. I use paint, but it'll be a shop you know, finish type Are of you thing. considering anodized, anodized aluminum by, by chance? No. No, you'd be out of the roof with that as aluminum. It'd be a, it's an aluminum product that's, that's powder coated. Um, the company that is uh, the bench that you're seeing is, is uh, by LFI Landscape Forms Incorporated. They have one of the better um, uh, powder coating processes that I've seen. Um, they're used in, uh, they're from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, so it's a very durable product, um, and they've switched mostly to aluminum just because of the corrosive activity that's going on with salting and whatnot. So, and their their uh, coating process is, is very superior. The other question I had in terms of Bill brought up the issue of the sidewalk. I've seen him do some very creative th things with bricks and uh, at, on campus, for example, in conjunction with sidewalks, and they're at the same plane and level and uh, you don't know the difference whether you're on the sidewalk or on the bricks if you do a good job of d doing the, you know, compacting of whatever sand and controlling it. Uh, you can add a foot very easily. So that might be a thought. Brandon. I had one question and then two quick comments. The question was, uh, is it possible, have you at all considered the idea with the trash receptacles of also having a U-cycle receptacle be part of the trash receptacle so people could separate out recycling. Is, I don't know if I appreciate that comment, but yes, we would like to incorporate something like that with the containers that can be recycled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that would Papers. be great. People, so many people are, when they're doing their shopping, mm -hmm. you know, buy something to drink on the mm -hmm. way out the grocery line, have bottles, aluminum cans. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is a huge thing. And for a corridor where we want to encourage people to hang out, to sit around a sculpture, um, to make them just throw everything in the trash, seems kind of against our other goals. So while we're picking out these beautiful receptacles with the prairie theme that match the benches, it's really beautiful stuff if there's a way to get receptacles that could hold U-cycling. I know we'd have to collect it. And our current vendors, you know, we don't have a contract to dump those cans, but we don't have a contract to dump the trash either. We've got to figure out how to dump both of them. So um, if we can plan it in from the start, I think that'd be great. My two other quick comments about the bikes. Um, I agree about the location of bike parking racks that people park nearest the destination. So the most important bike racks are at the doors or near the doors. The one other thing I'd consider a destination that people might want to park near is the pocket park. If there is really a nice pocket park with sculpture and seating, that could be a destination that people actually want to go to and stop at. That might be one place where people would want to park a bike. Um, my last comment just about the sidewalks, it is a tough trade-off. It seems to me with all the competing priorities that tearing up perfectly good sidewalk isn't the best use of funds for the corridor. And given that we have other sidewalk gaps in town, I know there are still sidewalk gaps within the school walk radius of like Yankee Ridge School. And if we can't provide even any sidewalk, to tear up a perfectly good four foot sidewalk on both stretches and all of this and dig the whole thing out just to pour one that's a little wider doesn't seem with all our priorities to make sense to me personally. So just a comment. Dennis? Well, this has turned out to be a, a very nice plan. It's, um, it's not overwrought. It's pretty thoughtful. Um, and I, I liked uh, on the display that you've had, um, the side panel shows uh, native plants, uh, coneflowers, um, um, the golden um, daylilies and uh, taller grasses. And it looked like that was the plan, perhaps, that some of these are named in the planting structure. And they and you also are showing a fairly dense um, level of planting so that there's good massing for color. I think this is going to be a very nice aspect of the plan. If we can establish these native plants and make them hardy in a couple of years, they're going to do almost the most to change the aspect of this corridor. It's going to go from being basically a, uh, a sidewalk and street cement uh, parking lot oriented look to very possibly a very thick planted color colorscape. And I think this is going to soften the corridor a lot and enhance it quite a bit. So I'm 
very hopeful that that's a possible thing. My, uh, that's a comment. I have a question. Um, you don't really show them here, and I, I'm trying to do from memory. I think you showed maybe one or two images where the existing street, the power poles, the telephone lines. Um, as I recall, they're on wood, wood posts. So I'm wondering about uh, how the integration, how you can visually integrate them more strongly into the landscape. And there's nothing that can hide a telephone pole. I mean, it looks like one. Yeah, and I didn't find specific uh, suggestion about whether it might be painted or not. Is it, did you? Are you suggesting anything for treatment, or does the city have the ability to render uh, color to posts, or are these not the property of the city? We couldn't it's possibly not do this. The city, you'd have to get approval from from the utility. Um, I encourage it. I think it's a great idea. I think uh, you might have overheard a cu couple of the comments that were made during the Shrep process of trying to create that as a sculptural element. And mm -hmm. What you do to, to tie that together, some people, I'd even come up with the idea of it was some kind of a shrink wrap kind of deal. I mean, but yeah, whatever can be done, um, they don't get disguised. So rather than disguise them, why not celebrate them? They're here, they're not right. going to go away. What can you do to make them as more of a sculptural element? So. I think it may not be possible to wrap things on them because there has to be probably utility accessibility. You don't want to be climbing on the sculpture to get to the uh, broken line. But certainly a discussion about painting them in you know whatever color that might match the utility poles across the street or complement it. Are you talking about you were talking about a bronze color or whatever? Um, I mean, if we could have a discussion with the power company and bring them into this as well, we might have a wonderful solution to address one of the probably the, the least appealing aspects of the corridor is the the power lines which we can't bury so just to, those are my comments thank you Lynn Barnes um, the only comment I would have to say about the sidewalks is that I agree with Brandon that probably um, you know it's a, it's a well it's a lot of money but I guess I would advocate for us to do one side I think a five foot wide sidewalk makes a big difference on people um, choosing to walk through the area and I know whether you run with a partner or you run with your dog or you're you know you choose your path and you're rollerblading you know you choose your path kind of depending on where you know you've got some decent sidewalks and while I agree they're in pretty good shape the, the narrowness of them is an inhibitor to choosing that corridor for exercise with somebody and then you'd stop and get something to drink or so I, I think I, I, I think you're right. We probably shouldn't afford and shouldn't plan to do two, but I think we should consider strongly that we would do at least one side. And if we had to choose sides, I mean, maybe there's further thought would need to go into that, but I'm thinking west just because there's more businesses along that side. But uh, What about um, Robert's suggestion about putting bricks? Is that less expensive than tearing up and oh, putting no. a new sidewalk or much Great. more? Yeah, it's even expensive. more money than <clears> – <throat> I'm sorry, it's more money than concrete, actually. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I. But look, that's what we have in the downtown. We can still explore those ideas, but yeah, though, I'm afraid to do it right. You really need to, um, for a one foot strip, you probably need to remove it all. Um, if we were, the other thought I heard is, you know, if one side or the other was to be like a side path, like an eight, then. If you do a bona fide four or five foot width uh, in addition to the existing, then there's a little better um, longevity and constructability that could be done, but we might need to be getting easements or right of way acquisition, things of that sort. It's just a lot of space that it takes up. So it, there's been no real good, easy, this is the best route to go. Um, Charlie. I'd like to see us move forward with this and, and get it started. Um, I think it might be worthwhile to, uh, I, think, I think Lynn's along the right direction. Let's at least commit to half of it. I'd like to see us do all of it if we can afford it. The only way we can afford it is to have a special service district. They do that in Campus Town. Campus Town has, you know, been slowly um, being reju rejuvenated. They're, they're planning on expanding it all the way to Neal. We know how, how effective that's been. It's attracted a lot of businesses there, um, and, and um, Campus Town is a huge portion of Champaign's tax base. Uh, but they have a special service district to, to get that done. Uh, I'd like to see us at least get started on half of it, but also continue this discussion 
uh, in, in the near future with Public Works about actually having a special service district and incorporating some of the other landscaping ideas into that. Um, so I, I don't know how that would fit into budget plans or timing or anything else, but but I'd be I'd be incur I'd be supportive of, of that kind of a approach. Dennis, this is probably a very tiny comment, but um, it might be a, a corridor that we could um, encourage community participation as far as adopt a corridor, adopt a you know an eighth of a city mile by clubs and uh, community groups. We could put uh, plaques up saying that, you know, this this block is uh, being cleaned on a, you know, or whatever whatever the pro whatever that process is with the community group. They, they monitor and make it, a, make it a project of their group to come out and pick up trash occasionally. And while it may not answer all of the costs that we expect to have in this district, it may alleviate some of the immediate um, concerns for beautification, and it would be a good community tie-in. So I don't know if we have that in place in some other parts of town, but that might be a nice corridor. Okay, we have a motion. Oh, Danielle. Thanks. I just wanted to comment on the sidewalk issue. You know, my preference would actually be to you know, move forward with this and and consider the sidewalk issue and actually revisit it soon, rather than making a decision right at this moment. It seems like a, it's a big, it seems like a big decision, and it's so much a part of trying to make this pedestrian friendly that I'd hate to see us make um, a decision off the cuff. Um, I'd like to have time to walk both sides, see what it feels like. I, because a lot of it has to do with how close is the sidewalk to the street. Do you feel like you're really close to the street when you're walking on the sidewalk? And I do know that for, with narrow sidewalks, people will avoid them. So we, you know, we spend $50,000 on pedestrian lighting, but then we don't get the pedestrians or, you know, we spend. So, so one thing we might want to consider is let's walk it and then let's um, consider possibly scaling back other parts of the project to make room. I don't think that it's wise for us to look at, okay, another 150000 on top of this, given that we're borrowing. It just seems, that doesn't seem like the right direction. So I would say, you know, what if we didn't have any boulders? What if we took one or two benches out and we really focused on right near the MTD and right near places where we're, the, the pocket park where we're sure that people are going to be? Um, let's Definitely, I think, look at cost sharing with private developers um, in this area and the service district issue. Um, and then, you know, there is some contingency in here as well, although I know you can't count on that. But, um, but I, I, you know, it's possible that we could just really focus in on the parts, you know, even, even having three sculptures instead of four sculptures in this area if the sculptures are really easy for people to get to. Um, so I guess I would say let's... Can we revisit the sidewalk issue? Let's actually walk it and see how comfortable it is. And let's look at one side versus both sides, et cetera. Because in the larger scheme of things, I mean, think about how many cities you've gone to. And you walk through the city, and you see a terrible design, design decision. And you think, how is it? You know, there's all this beautiful place, but, you know, there isn't sidewalks. Or the sidewalks don't work, et cetera. And so I guess I just don't, it doesn't make sense for us to invest to the amount that we're talking about and not have adequate pedestrian services so let's look at it. Uh, how long do the sidewalks last? What's their expected life? Easily 50 years yeah. or more. So yeah. I, I think if it's going to last that long, we'd be better off just to do the whole thing right to begin with, even if Probably. we have to borrow. Yeah. OK, Lynn Barnes. I guess I just have a comment about I, I would hate to see us piecemeal the plan. Yeah. I think if we're going to do the sidewalks, let's bite the bullet and let's do the sidewalks. And, and, and keep the plan intact. Because I think then if you, if you begin to pull things out and changing, then you're kind of altering, you know, all the work that's kind of been done heretofore. And I think, you know, again, it, we're, this is a big step. I agree. It's a lot of money. But I think it's an investment well worth it. And then I think it'll, have a, it'll make, potentially make a huge difference in what happens in the long term. Heather. On that note, I think we bite the bullet now, and I'm not putting this – on my kids where it's $150,000 now and in years it's years to come my kids aren't looking at paying taxes to make it because it's 
$250,000 versus 150 right now. Um, you know, I don't know the what, how much concrete goes up or not, but I know that what people are paid is going to go up, you know, 20 years from now. So um, I, I say if we're going to do it, let's bite the bullet now because I don't want to leave this on my kids, you know, with a lot more to pay for them to pay. Dennis. One thing that we haven't really mentioned is that that uh, making this pedestrian friendly and the fact that new buildings are being a uh, new new commercial buildings are being developed and we're having new retail stores appearing as um, as uh, you know sub sublot development along the corridor and in front of um, Sunnycrest is exactly the perfect and right kind of um, infill development that a city should be experiencing. Yes, it's not downtown, but it is bringing back really what it is is a neighborhood center of shopping convenience on the on the east side, southeast side of our city. This is exactly what people like to have is an as a neighborhood center. They can walk to, they can access easily. There are new apartments being built, and there are many homes and residences in this new this nearby area, plus a couple of schools. So it would make very good sense for the city to make this work. So I maybe I'm saying that I'm, maybe I agree with the five the five foot sidewalk because because this is a, a an ideal example of appropriate urban design. This is infill um, development, and and that is like one of the best things a city can experience. Bill. Well, for me, this is very good feedback, and in the next two to four weeks, we will put our brainstorming hats on here to see what we can do um, and, and get back to you with some ideas and costs and, and see how we can fit this better into our budget here. And I mean, I'm totally sensitized to that cost and want to minimize it, and, and, and I'm conflicted because of the, the ped friendliness that we don't have out there that... Just being out there today, the two hours walking up and down both sides. And now today was a nice day, but there's a lot of pedestrian activity: bicyclists riding, strollers, little children, older, you know, all mixes of people they'd love to see, you know, out there today. And, and yet it was very evident. And Garrett took a few pictures, you know, that that narrow width. It's kind of you know see people walking to abreast. You know, it's just it's too narrow. So um, anyway. This is good feedback for us, and give us two, four weeks here to to digest this and see what we can come up with. So, just keep in mind that, um, like Dennis was saying, you're getting infill now, and if it does what it's supposed to do, it's going to be even more. And so, if it's even more, you're going to have more pedestrian people, well, more people out on the street. So, just keep that in mind. Danielle, so really brief comment, which is if we take up the sidewalk. Let's consider doing something that that fits with this design that's really distinctive. Like, would it be possible to actually have the sidewalk flow <laughs> like some of the landscaping flows? Would it be possible to have it have kern have curved pieces? So if we take the sidewalk up, we really take advantage of the fact that we're not just adding a foot, but we're actually making parts that are wider and parts that are narrower and they flow along. And people really respond to very subtle changes like that. That that would be this um, this really distinctive aspect to Philo Road. You've got the prairie grasses. You've got a sidewalk that doesn't look like any other place. Kind of like we have the brick sidewalks, where there's special places that are brick sidewalks. And so, in looking at prices, it might make sense to see if we could incorporate the the softer edges into it, and possibly have places that were a little bit wider than five feet. You know, and, and look at, you know, if we're only adding a foot and we're tearing up the whole thing, maybe we need to look at five and a half feet for a sidewalk and really make sure that it, that it, bec it becomes part of the whole picture of what we're looking at. So that's a comment. I don't know what it costs to do flowing sidewalks. I've certainly seen them. Campus, I mean, right outside the Seabull building is a really great example of that kind of usage of sidewalks. And when you walk there, you immediately notice it's different than any other place on campus. You have these kind of flowing areas, or by the Boneyard, they also did the same thing. And you feel the difference in those areas. So maybe we can take advantage of that. I, I have to comment, Daniel. I'm a person that walks on the other side of um, 
where part because I can't stand the winding sidewalk. <laughs> so I walk a lot, and I want to get from point A to point B. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, right. Brandon? Another just if there is replacement or new concrete pavement being poured, another option that may be cost effective, I'm not sure, is colored or tinted concrete. I, I believe you can color concrete. It makes the area feel really distinctive. It could be part of the colorscape that's so unique here. And it could just break up the fact that there's so much gray pavement out there now that we want to do something different than that. So I assume we can a, a, a approve or accept the design development plan and still investigate the sidewalks, right? Yeah, that's OK. OK, let's, let's we have a motion by Heather, seconded by Charlie. Um, to accept the design development. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you.